Hey, thanks so much for worshiping with us today online. We are so excited that you are here. We've got a great day planned. We've got a message from Pastor Brendan. We've got a kids' corner just for your kids. But right now, we're going to Pastor Micah and Jess for worship. for 
change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never felt me yet See your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness But your faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence but you never failed one more time your promise your promise still stands great is your faithfulness lord your faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my
I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Lord, you've never failed me yet. Wow. What an incredible worship experience. Again, we want to thank you so much for joining us online today. Maybe this was your very first experience at Christ Church Fort Worth. Would you let us know? Would you take your phone right now and text the number CCFW Guests to the number 97000? We would love to connect with you this week. In fact, we'd love to send you a digital gift. Uh, maybe as you are watching this video or you even watch this video later in the week and you know that you need prayer. Our team is standing by and one of our team members would love to pray with you. You just simply have to text CCFW prayer to that same number 97,000. Well, as we continue our worship, we want to give all of you an opportunity to give. Giving is such an incredible thing. In fact, here at Christ Church, we believe we value making big sacrifices to reach the lost. And your giving continues to allow us to do that, not just here on our campus, not just in our city, but even to our Kingdom Builder partners around the world. In fact, right now, I want you to hear from one of our Kingdom Builder partners. His name is Chad Phillips. He works with our MKs or our missionary kids, and he's got a special message for you today. Hello, Christ Church. Greetings to you from Springfield, Missouri. Uh, Chad Phillips here, uh, MK Director for Simmons God World Missions. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you for your continued support of missions and missionaries around the world. Uh, I can tell you firsthand that they are doing amazing things through the midst of all of this happening. As a MK ministry, we have continued to help our families go through the transitions and challenges of living overseas. Uh, obviously, MKs during this time uh, are living in very unique places around the world. Uh, some of the places have military guards guarding houses to make sure nobody leaves their homes. Uh, just a very different experience for many of them. But as a ministry, we've been connecting with MKs more now than um, ever before. We have calls on a daily basis. We're meeting with 60 to 80 missionary kids, uh, phone calls, Zoom calls, FaceTime calls. Uh, it's been an incredible time of ministry with them. And of course, the school. As you know, we launched a school a few years ago with the help of one of your own, Bethany Skipper, helped us launch the school. And the school is thriving in the midst of this. It's a distance ed school based online. Our teachers are all in the States. But all of our families that were enrolled in our school have seen no academic disruption at all, and it's been a huge blessing. Uh, if anything, we've seen more families contact us now than ever before, wanting more information about enrolling their kids for next year in our online school. So it's been a huge blessing. If anything, this time has really increased our presence in the lives of missionary kids and families around the world. And it's incredible to see and hear from them what God is doing through them uh, and in the lives of their local communities, even in the midst of this COVID virus. So thank you for all you do to make this a possibility for us and for touching lives of families and missionary kids all around the world because of your investment in the MK program. Thank you guys, we appreciate you so much. Pray you have an amazing week of services. We love dropping in on you and joining you for services as well. God bless you guys. Thanks, Chad. Thank you for all the work that you are doing to help our missionary kids. Now, parents, I need you to do me a favor right now. I need you to gather your kids into the room, get them close, make sure they can see the screen, make sure they can hear, because Pastor Leah is ready for our Kids Corner. You guys, I have the coolest thing to show you. Do you guys want to see this cool thing that I learned? Yes. Okay, so let's pretend. Are you guys good at pretending? Okay, we're gonna pretend that we are this cup. So this is us. It's all nice and clean and clear. But do you know what happens? Sometimes we make bad choices. Like maybe we don't tell the truth and then we get a little bit dirty on the inside. And this cup is kind of like sin. So maybe we told a lie and then maybe we hurt somebody on accident. Like maybe we, we punch somebody 
And then maybe our mommy asked us to do something and we got really mad and we yelled. And all of that sin goes into us and it's not so clear anymore, is it? No. Now what color is it? Blue. Blue. But did you know that when we pray and we ask Jesus to come into our hearts and forgive us of our sin, when Jesus comes into our lives, it starts to get a little less messy. And then the more time we spend with Jesus, and as we allow Jesus to be in charge of our lives, he starts to change our lives and everything gets a lot more clear. And all the sin goes away and he cleans our lives up so that we can spend time with him. Isn't that awesome that Jesus can change our lives and take away all the messy stuff and make it clean again? How about, yeah, you can take a turn spinning it. It makes it all better whenever we let Jesus into our lives. So why don't we take a minute and let's pray and let's thank Jesus for making us clean and new, okay? Uh, we just have a little bit too much. It might spill, but we can still pray, okay? All right, let's close our eyes. Say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus thank you for making me. Thank you for making me. And thank you for making me clean. And thank you for making me clean. Help me to do. Help me to do the right things. The right things. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Good job, guys. Welcome back to week two of our Infinitely More series, where we are believing that God wants to do infinitely more in our life. If you weren't with us last week, I invite you to go back and watch Pastor's sermon on week one, telling us how God has planned everything from the beginning. We get our verse uh, for this series out of Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, which literally tells us, now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. You see, I want to start off by letting you know, God sees more in you. God sees more in you than you might even see in yourself. Now, I know there's some of you that grew up like me that really didn't struggle with confidence. See, at uh, 12 years old, I really felt like I could do anything. And I would let everybody know that. Um, I remember one time I made a pivotal mistake. I was out with my buddy in South Fort Worth at his, at his ranch and he had a roping arena. And uh, he was a cowboy, like a real cowboy. And I liked the idea of being a cowboy. I liked the idea of roping and riding and steers and all that stuff. And so I made this statement. I said, you know, I think I'd make a good cowboy. And I remember he stopped in his tracks. He dead stopped. He turned around and looked at me and he goes, what'd you say? I said, I think I could be a cowboy. And I did it with some of this kind of like, you know, it's not that big of a deal. What's the thing? And he goes, well, let's give you the cowboy test. And I didn't know there was a cowboy test. In fact, to today, I realized this was not the cowboy test. He just made this up and, and he said, here, come follow me. And he roped a steer, a roping steer, and he pulled it to the side of the arena. And I was like, I could do that. And he goes, that's not the test. And he pulled the steer over to the side and he said, hop on. What? He said, jump on the back. This is a cowboy test. See if you can ride this steer. Now, this was not a bull. This did not have big horns. This was not a massive creature. It only came up to about my chest, but I was afraid. I was petrified. Now I go, I'm not going to do that. This is silly. And he goes, you said you want to be a cowboy. You said you could be a cowboy. Jump on. So my brother was there. He was there. And they started talking me up. Dude, you could do this. It's not that big of a deal. This isn't even a bull. This is just a steer. Just, just jump on. And so... I thought to myself, you know what, I, they're right, I could do this, and I jumped on it. I remember 
the moment I climbed up the chute and I set my behind on top of this steer, I felt the power underneath me and I go, this is a bad decision. <laughs> I should not do this. And they started talking me up. You know how your friends do when they want you to make a bad decision? They're like, no man, you totally got this. This is gonna be so cool. And then they said the thing that they knew was gonna get me. They said, we'll tell the youth group and the girls will really like you. Yeah, no, I'm in. So I sat back down, I put my hand underneath the, the, the rope and I tightened my grip and then it just adjusted. Like it, it didn't jump, it didn't lurch, it just kind of adjusted for my body weight on top of it. And again, I felt that and I go, this is a really bad idea. I pulled my hand out of the rope and I go, Jordan, I don't wanna do this. And he says, I can remember, he said, too late, slapped it on the butt and it took four huge jumps. I mean, just one, two, three. Now I only got to one. They told me he jumped afterwards because at one, I flew in the air almost like effortlessly just wide open, landed square on my back in the middle of the arena. My brother and Jordan rushed to my side, feeling that they were gonna come and comfort me, only to realize that they are literally crying in laughter, saying that that is the funniest thing they've ever seen. And the only thing that I could utter out of my breathless mouth was, Ugh, I hate you, which just made them laugh even more. But the truth is they, they wanted me to, to, to get on this bull, to try something they knew I could not do. But the great thing is, is that when God looks at me, he actually sees potential, like real life things that I can do that I don't even know are possible. You see, I wanna look at the life of Peter. Peter, one of the early disciples that Jesus calls out. Peter, the guy that Jesus, I believe, saw more in him than Peter ever saw in himself. We see one day that Jesus is, is teaching on the shore and he realizes the crowds have gathered so much that he needs to get some distance away so that they can hear and proclaim. So he jumps in Peter's boat and he asks him to take him off the shore so he can preach from the edge of the waters. And Peter does so. Jesus finishes up his, his sermon and turns to Peter and asks how the fishing has been. And Peter, a trained fisherman, says to Jesus, man, we haven't caught anything. In other words, he's saying there's no fish out here because Peter knew how to fish. Peter was a fisherman. Spent his whole life fishing, spent his whole life on the boat. And Jesus tells Peter to go put your nets out in deeper water. Now this is Jesus, a good teacher man, so far as they know, maybe even a prophet, but not a fisherman. And I don't know if anyone's ever come and told you how to do your job, but I like to tell them people that you can walk away. <laughs> Listen, you don't know how to do what I do, so please don't try to tell me how to do it. And yet Jesus tells Peter, why don't you go fish over there? We read about this interaction in Luke chapter five, verse three through five, where Jesus told Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let the nets down for a catch. And Simon Peter answered, master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. He looks at Jesus, an untrained fisherman and a guy who we don't even know if he's ever caught a fish in his life. And he's giving Peter an ultimatum. He says, do you trust me? Really is what Jesus was asking. Do you trust me enough to obey me? Go and fish out there. And Peter says, listen, we've been fishing all night. It doesn't seem like this is gonna work. I think I know what I'm doing, Jesus, but I love that response. But because you say so. How often does God ask us to do something, ask us to, to, to try something new, ask us do we feel that sense inside of us to go do something that in our natural seems so unfamiliar, almost uh, impossible, but is our response, okay, but God, because you say so, I will do it. You see, what I believe is that God is looking for obedience over ability. I don't think he's impressed with our talents, our gifts, our abilities. I think he is honored by our obedience. When we say, okay, God, it doesn't make sense. Okay, God, we've already tried it this way, but because you say so, I will do it. You see, if there's more in you than you haven't seen it yet, and God is gonna try to draw that out, and the only way that he can do that is by asking you to do something that you weren't already gonna do. Hey, will you go talk to this person? Hey, will you start this new business? Hey, will you go and, and have that conversation one more time with that lost sibling or loved one? Well, God, it, I've tried that already. God, it doesn't look like it's possible. Right, but 
but God, because you say so, I will do it. You see, when we start acting out of obedience, God will start showing us our true ability. When we start acting and just saying, okay, God, I don't get it, I don't understand it, but because you say so, we'll start seeing how God sees more in us. Second interaction that we see with Peter again is on the boat. The disciples, Jesus tells them to go out and go ahead and go out on the boat. I'll meet you later. And then sometime later, this, this, this figure starts walking on the water and they're, they're worried it's a ghost and they see different things. And in Matthew 14, verse 27 through 29, Jesus said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. And then Peter, Peter who is constantly being, having this interaction with Jesus that is pushing the limits of his understanding. He says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus replies, come. And Peter steps out of the boat and walks on water. Peter steps out of the boat. This is a big deal for Peter had probably spent more time of his life on that boat than anywhere else. And yet because Jesus says, come. Again, he's showing this obedience. This, uh, you know that Peter has no ability to walk on water. But again, he's so in love with Jesus. He so trusts Jesus that it now it just takes one word, come. And Peter steps out of what is comfortable and easy something that he knows and has lived with all of his life and he walks on water. He steps out of what is comfortable and easy to follow Jesus. Can I tell you that God's call on your life stretches your comfort zone? God is always, always, always asking you to do something that is outside of what is easy and normal. If it was easy or normal, you could do it on your own. But what God sees in you and what God wants to do through you will stretch your comfort zone, will stretch what you think you're capable of. And so when Peter says, just tell me to come and I'll come, what he's literally saying is, I trust you completely. I trust you completely. I trust you with what I know and what I understand, which is that I'll survive on this boat. And what I don't get, which is that somehow I could possibly walk on water. If we stay where it's easy and comfortable, we'll never be able to experience the infinitely more that God has for us. And then I also wanna let you know for some of us, it's not always easy and perfect, even for Peter. You see, Peter, even though through all these interactions, something happened that we, we actually talked about a couple weeks ago at Easter. Jesus is arrested. Jesus is taken to Pilate. He's put on trial. And Jesus even told Peter, hey, just so you know, you're going to deny me. Lord, I would never. God, I, I would never do that to you. And yet in the middle of this fear and confusion, doubt and frustration, when everything didn't work out the way Peter thought they were going to, he does exactly what Jesus tells him he's going to. And he denies him. He stops trusting. He stops believing. And even Peter, this mighty man who we see walk on water, takes a step away from Jesus. I don't know what Peter was thinking. I don't know what was going on, but I'm sure he felt like he had completely lost it. He had completely given up on this relationship that had spent years developing. He had, he, had, he had failed Jesus. And yet after the resurrection, after a few days, Jesus finds Peter again. Where do we find Peter? We find him right back on that comfort zone, right back on the boat, out there fishing. The same interaction we read about chapters earlier, Jesus once again calls out to Peter, hey, why don't you drop your nets on the other side of the boat? For some reason, Peter hears this and does not remember what has already happened for he just does it and then sees this amount of fish and he realizes, hold on, who was that? Who was that that told me to drop the nets and then realizes it's Jesus? He runs out after Jesus and, and begins almost thinking to himself, well, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna do? And yet Jesus restores Peter and he says, do you love me? Do you love me? See, Peter must have thought when he was back on the boat, okay, I guess I go back to what is usual. I failed. I messed up. I, I, I walked away. I, I, I didn't do what God was asking me to do. I made a mistake. But can I tell you, God's purpose still stands even 
when you walk away. When Peter walked away from that, that moment of denying Christ, when he walked back onto the boat, what he was literally doing was he was walking away from Jesus. But the good news is, the hope is that when you and I walk away, God still comes to us just like Jesus came to Peter. He comes back and he says, I know you've made a mistake, but I still love you. I know you failed, but I still have plans for you. I know you think that you discredited yourself, but you didn't because I still see infinitely more in you. See, some of you right now, you felt like you walked away from Jesus. Maybe during this time of quarantine, you've stepped back into some old bad habits. You've stepped away from the church and your daily routine, and you're finding yourself, man, I'm, I'm not where I once was. I'm not where Jesus had brought me. But today, I'm telling you that that doesn't have to be the case anymore. For God is saying, as long as you're still living, I still have a plan for you, and I can still restore you. Just like he did Peter on the day that he called him back out from the boat, God is calling you today and saying, hey, I still see more in you. And nothing that you have done has discredited you from being the person I've called, created, and destined you to be. What I want to let you know today, right now, is that God still sees more in you. I don't care how good you've had it. I don't care how many accomplishments hang on your wall. God still sees more in you. I don't care if today this is the first time you're hearing that there is a God that loves you. God sees more in you today than you see in yourself. And if you could just do what Peter did, if you could just respond by saying, yes. Yes, you want me to come? I'll come. Yes, you want me to stop doing this? I'll stop. Yes, you want me to step out of what is easy and comfortable and follow you? Okay, I'll do it. Because you'll never you'll never experience a life of infinitely more doing what you've always done, staying where you've always stayed, being who you've always been. But when you can allow yourself to trust God enough to just say, yes, because you said so, I will do it. When we start acting out of obedience, when we start stepping out of our comfort zone, and when we realize that nothing we have done can discredit us from being who God has destined us to be, we can start living a life of infinitely more with Jesus. Today, before I go, I want you to know God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose that He has destined and imprinted so deep inside of you that nothing and no one can take it away. And today, I want to offer up a prayer for you. You might be sitting there saying, I don't know what it is. I don't know where God's wanted me. I'm believing that today he's going to start putting inspiration inside of you, dreams and visions of what he's always planned and destined for your life. Today, some of you might be sitting there saying, Pastor Brendan, I don't even know who this Jesus is you're talking about. Today, I believe that just as he walked on the shore to meet Peter, he's walking into your living room, into your coffee shop, into your office, and he wants to speak and interact with you today. So if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've been living a Christ-following life for decades, it doesn't matter. Today, God wants to encounter you. So let me pray for you. I want to pray that God will inspire you, that God will challenge you. And just like Peter, you can step up and just say, yes, Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you're doing for my friends. God, I thank you that today, Men and women, young men and young ladies are stepping out of the boat, stepping out of what is comfortable and easy to follow you, to step up and say, I will go where you've called me to go. I will do what you've called me to do. God, what you see in them, would you begin to show them and prove it to them by giving them dreams and visions that will inspire and challenge them to become the person that you have always destined and purposed them to be. God, I thank you that you don't need our abilities. You just need our obedience. So today, may we step up and be obedient to the calling that you've put on our life. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and the honor. For you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Wow, what an incredible day it has been. Once again, thanks for joining us online. We are so glad that you were here with us today. Well, as we're closing out service, I wanna help you know and understand that your next step might just be one text away. What I mean by that is simply, if you were a guest today, would you let us know by texting CCFW guest to the number 97,000? Maybe you have a prayer request. One of our team members would love to contact you and pray with you. You just simply have to text CCFW prayer to that same number, 97,000. Well, we've just kicked off a brand new Bible reading plan and we'd love for you to join us there. Let me tell you, you're one text away right now now you can simply text CCFW Bible to that same number, 97,000. We want to make your next step as easy as possible and continue to partner with you in this faith journey. We also appreciate you partnering with us and giving to not just here to our church, but to our Kingdom Builder partners all around the world. If you still want to give, you can at the link below. Well, again, it's been a fantastic day. We want to continue the conversation right now. I want to invite you to click out, go to Facebook. Facebook Live, Christ Church, Fort Worth, where Pastor Darius would love to join you in our after party foyer.